Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you had an amazing open ceremony so far and had a great time at your break. Um, before we go into the first plenary session, um, I would like to introduce everyone to our great moderators for the session. Um, we have here with us Eric Arndt. Eric Arndt, he is the director of the Rockefeller Foundation in Asia, uh, based in Bangkok. Um, he has helped advance the Asia Regional Office and help in with strengthening partnership driven strategy and support regional team building capacities. And he used to work in UNICEF and we have here with him today. Please welcome Eric Arndt. All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the HT Asia Link Annual Conference 2022. I'm sure you are all excited to be here together in person after two years of COVID disruptions. Uh, this is actually my second major conference uh, since things started opening up, and it's a pleasure to be mingling with everyone today. It's my pleasure to be here uh, to join and consider what health systems and HTA could look like after COVID. This has been an unprecedented period in the acceleration of health technologies and experimentation in public health responses. And as the pandemic stabilizes, it's a good time today to pause and reflect. Before doing so together, I'd like to briefly introduce the Rockefeller Foundation's work uh, in the COVID response space. The foundation has been in the field of public health for more than a century, including starting here in Thailand in 1917 by partnering with the Royal Thai government to help eradicate hookworm. Since then, we have continued to support institutions in Thailand and globally to advance public health. When COVID-19 first struck, our efforts were focused on what we called at the time pandemic, uh, sorry, precision public health, an initiative to strengthen digitalization of public health, starting with primary health care and community health workers. We quickly pivoted our efforts to increase access and reduce cost of COVID testing and established a network of pandemic surveillance institutions globally, including Mahidol University here in Thailand to support work across Asia. We have also supported the establishment of new institutions such as the WHO Hub for Pandemic and Epidemic Intelligence, which is based in Berlin. And we are supporting efforts to develop and adapt pandemic modeling to generate timely, actionable information for policymakers to plan public health and economic response measures. In the Asia region, we are partnering with TITAP, which brings me to today's event and to today's topic. HTA has undergone significant changes as the pandemic brought new urgent challenges to the HTA community. This has led to some big wins, such as a surprising ability to respond to urgent policy questions, including identifying priority populations for vaccination and, uh, and identifying, sorry, for including identifying priority populations for vaccination programs at high speed. It has also highlighted gaps that need to be filled such as strong national data systems for pandemic surveillance and reporting, which may have slow, slowed policy responses to the pandemic. It's put great pressure on the HTA community to rapidly generate evidence, straining human and financial capacity in some countries. Indeed, conferences like this one, HTA Asia Link, are important steps to respond to some of these constraints. And the pandemic has generated new priorities for the HTA community, such as epide epidemiology modeling, vaccine program assessment, and brought greater attention to digital and telehealth, which we'll be discussing shortly. Today, we will review aspects of the pandemic's impact on HTA and what the future might hold for the community. From the, from the Rockefeller Foundation's perspective, some questions that arise post-COVID regarding HTA include, how can the HTA community best respond to the pressures faced during COVID? For example, the demand to rapid assessment that I mentioned and human resource constraints. What global best practices should the community be drawing from? And I'm sure there'll be much discussion of that here at the conference this week. How do we best prepare policymakers to understand and utilize information generated by HTA in times of health crisis when we're at great, everyone's under great pressure? Also, how do we inform the broader public about the importance and requirements of HTA to make more effective public health decisions? 
What future challenges should we anticipate? For example, the growing health impacts of climate change. What does that mean for the HDA community? And what are the future resourcing requirements of health shock responsive HTA? In anticipation of today's session, we asked participants what you thought were the greatest challenges during the pandemic. We did a little poll. Uh, if you can pull that up quickly. On the Uova app, you still have two seconds to answer the poll if you, have it, if you want to. I'm not sure if it's coming up. I have it on my screen here. Here we are. So out of, out of about 20, 23 responses, we had uh, two leading uh, responses. First is human resources, and second is COVID-19 project load. I think these are quite linked, uh, and I do hope we can reflect on the responses to these challenges in the session and across the conference. Well, that's enough from me for now. On to today's speakers. We are fortunate to have with us today rep representatives from around the world. First, Professor Shankar Prinja, Executive Director of the Indian National Health Authority, will share with us India's efforts to institutionalize HTA before, during, and after the pandemic. Afterwards, Mr. Ying Li Chen, HTA researcher at the Taiwan Center for Drug Evaluation, will share with us Taiwan's experience and learnings and patient involvement in HTA during the pandemic. Then, Dr. Mi Yong Choi, Director of the Clinical Evidence Research Team of the South Korea National Evidence-Based Healthcare Collaborating Agency, will introduce the role of HTA in deploying telehealth as a pandemic response tool in South Korea. And last but not least, Dr. Tessa Ediher, Coordinator of the Unit on Costs, Effectiveness, Expenditure, and Priority Setting in the Department of Health, Financing, and Governance of the WHO, will share a global perspective on the role of HTA in informing research priorities in the post-COVID era. After our panelists present, we will have some time for a Q&A. So please post your questions on the WOVA app as the, as the presenters speak. And please do vote for questions uh, as we go. We will take the questions with the most votes first during the Q&A. So you can vote for your own as well. That's not against the rules. But uh, please do be active on the app. We look forward to seeing uh, your thoughts and questions as we go. Uh, if you wish to direct a question at a specific speaker, please note so in, in your question on the app. And with that, thanks again, everyone, for joining. And Professor Shankar, I'd like to invite you up to the stage. Thank you. I think I'll request uh, them to change the picture unless somebody might suspect it's, an, um, in a, it's a case of impersonation. <laughs> but uh, thanks very much. Thanks to the organizers for uh, having invited me. And uh, I'll try and share over the next 15 minutes the experience on, uh, from India about the, the whole uh, efforts towards institutionalizing uh, the HTA. And then I'll try and take, uh, spend a little bit time on potentially what, what were the challenges that we faced across during the COVID period. So I'll spend this uh, presentation and it's, I'll split it into three parts. The first part I'll try and talk about more from the supply side, which is that how did we try and establish the systems for HT in, uh, in India and, and what were the kind of um, building blocks that we invested our energy on. The second part of the presentation is going to focus much more on trying to create those mechanisms of translation of uh, this HTA evidence for policy making. And this is through the functional relationships that we've established with the National Health Authority that manages the National Insurance Program. And finally, the third part of the presentation, I'll speak on what has been the impact of COVID and what, has, what, what it has in terms of implications for HTA researchers. So for some of you who attended the first CME, some of these slides might, might look a little familiar. Uh, where we did discuss a little bit in terms of journey of HT in India, which began with several important uh, policy documents highlighting the need for, uh, for, for HTA and systems of evidence-informed decision-making, incorporating economic evaluation, cost-effectiveness evidence to be considered uh, as one of the important aspects. In fact, uh, the 12th five-year plan, uh, which, was, uh, which was in 2012, for the first time, it inc incorporated an indicator that was for tracking the measurement of out-of-pocket expenditures, 
which was never the case in the entire history of planning for healthcare in India. So all through until 11th five-year plans, since the last about 50 years or so since, uh, since independence and since the time that these five-year plans had been started, we'd all been focused around tracking the coverage of healthcare services. But this was the first time that healthcare costs became an important consideration for policymakers. And similarly, the, we had uh, the national health policy which articulated the need to set up an independent system for evaluation which measures the, uh, the costs and the outcomes of healthcare services in order to make decisions. And based on these recommendations, eventually the HTA agency was established in 2017. Uh, and then more recently, we are trying to uh, make, uh, give a little bit more teeth to these, this uh, HTA agency by having a more, much more statutory backing by creating a law. But this is something that has taken a lot of time. So you can see the last three years it has been spent in refining and formulating this entire architecture. In terms of the functional status, it functions as a kind of a hub and spoke model where we have the central secretariat which is housed within uh, the India's Department of Health Research, which is somewhat uh, autonomous, but still it reports to the Ministry of Health. So while there is a bit of an autonomy in terms of undertaking the research, but there is a accountability and a functional linkage with the Ministry of Health. So this body operates as the secretariat, and then uh, it gets the studies commissioned through a kind of a hub and spoke model, where several academic institutions and uh, research centers have been identified to conduct these HD assessments. And these are the regional resource centers and the uh, technical partners. This is guided in terms of uh, the entire technical appraisal by a committee. And finally, it uh, has relationship with departments that submit the topics which are these user departments. So in a way it functions in this manner that we have different user departments that are listed on top which are basically either payer agencies or regulatory agencies. So these are the two broad nature of uh, these agencies. Incidentally, when we started off with the HTA uh, program, it was a conscious decision to limit the submission of topics from agencies that are holding public budgets. So in a typical language of national health accounts, we call them as uh, either the agents of healthcare financing or the ones who manage the schemes or uh, the, the, the programs of healthcare uh, organizations. So either these are these uh, agents or the schemes of uh, healthcare financing or these are regulatory agencies that make decisions around pricing regulations etc. So they are the ones who submit the topics and then there is a formal process of topic prioritization etc. And then as I illustrated earlier that it follows through a process whereby these topics are then prioritized by the, tech, by the, by the HT agency secretariat given to these, uh, uh, agent, these technical partners or regional resource centers who conduct these assessments. These uh, have, are reported back to the appraisal committee and both at the time of topic, uh, the proposal development and the, uh, the final draft report, at both these times there is a stakeholder uh, consultation. It's still not to the extent of participation and empowering as we had a discussion in the morning uh, in, in one of the sessions. But eventually based on this, finally the recommendations go on to the uh, HTA board, which is the final recommendatory body to the government. At the initial outset itself, when these systems were established, we realized there were three broad sets of uh, fundamental weaknesses that existed that impaired the entire work being done by the HTA researchers. First, there was relative lack of information systems. And second, there was, a, there was significant uh, heterogeneity in terms of the methods being used, so there was lack of standardization. So an effort was done to bridge those, both these two problems. A, address the problem of standardization, and B, address some of these building blocks or information systems that enable the HTA researchers carry out their studies in a much more timely fashion. And so as you can see, <coughs> uh, the, the ones in the green at the bottom are the two broad pillars of information systems that we tried establishing in terms of the health system cost database uh, and in terms of the, uh, uh, the value set for EQ5D. So both of these two things for cost analysis and 
uh, valuation of consequences, this became an uh, extremely important resource for HTA researchers. The second thing that we started focusing on was developing these guidelines. And as a part of that, there was a reference case that was developed for conduct of these HTA assessments, uh, an appraisal checklist for, measure, for looking at the quality or assessing the quality of these assessments. And finally, another, uh, as another guidebook for carrying out budget impact assessments. So these were some of the guidelines that were developed. Besides these, there were specific guidelines on processes that need to be followed, consultations, how they need to be carried out, et cetera. There's a study that is currently ongoing, which is to formulate a cost effectiveness threshold. And also there, are, there is some effort around uh, establishing information systems, specifically on those, those diseases that have great interest, one of them being cancer in particular. So specific study on developing a database of uh, costs and quality of life for cancer in particular. So those are some of the steps that had been taken in order to strengthen the, the creation of evidence uh, to enable decision making. The next step that we had uh, tried spending some energy on was to create systems for translation of this evidence for decision making or policy translation. And in order to do that, <coughs> there, was, there, there, has been, uh, there had been quite a lot of consultation with different stakeholders by the National Health Authority, which is the agency that implements the insurance program in order to develop some systems of HTA informed decision making. And in order to do that, as you can see, we first drafted a consultation paper that was, uh, that was disseminated through the website. And a round of consultations were organized with different stakeholder groups, including the industry, the hospitals, the clinicians, the community, uh, as well as the, the, the government agencies who were the regulators or the payers. And based on those, all those uh, suggestions that we received and recommendations that we got, a final policy was developed on these systems of price setting, provider payments, and decisions on inclusion into the health benefit package. And based on this, the kind of functional linkage between the National Health Authority, which is the decision-making body, and the HTIN, which is the secretariat for the, uh, for the HTA body, that was developed. And one of the other in things that was incorporated in this entire framework was that unlike the HTIN, which also receives topics nomination for HTA assessments, there was uh, an opportunity that was also created by the National Authority to receive topics for, that could be submitted for inclusion into the health benefit package. And here, it was not just limited to the public sector agencies, regulatory or the payer agencies, but it was also opened up to industry, professional associations, and hospitals. And the reason was that this operated in, a, in an entire context or a network of, or an ecosystem which comprised of both the public and the private sector stakeholders. So it became extremely important. And then this was also linked with, in, with some arrangements that were uh, made for subsequent use of this evidence for price negotiation, et cetera, and strategic purchasing. So this is the, uh, the we have a created a portal on our website that, is, uh, that enables stakeholders to submit topics for inclusion into the health benefit package. And each of these topics that are received, they undergo a very systematic assessment based on stipulated criteria. And based on that, a scoring system is created, which is then discussed in a, in a consultation in order to make decision on whether or not to consider these for HT assessments, or they may, not, may be discarded at the initial stage itself. And accordingly, it was decided that what could be the potential use of HTA for decisions within the, this insurance ecosystem. And there were a variety of different uh, use cases that were identified, beginning from decisions around strategic purchasing in terms of what to buy, from whom to buy, and at what price, but also including issues related to costing and pricing, also in trying to inform through the HTA evidence the standard treatment guidelines and the norms for delivery of clinical care that uh, were to be followed as part of the uh, insurance program. In addition, there are, there are also guidelines of value-based incentives that are now that have been drafted and a pilot has now been started in five Indian states, which is again, which has very significant input from, from the HTA evidence and which is trying to create an overall ecosystem of 
shifting the entire payment for healthcare uh, providers from a volume based uh, you know payments to a value based payment kind of uh, system and finally there's a lot of effort that is also going on in terms of building capacity as well in the next three slides i'll try and show you some examples of how this hta evidence has been put to use in the context of insurance for for informing certain decisions this is one of the uh, important uh, policies that we framed on peritoneal dialysis something very similar that we also saw from the high tap experience where they've used the hta evidence on dialysis to uh, to put forth the recommendations on use for peritoneal dialysis something that has been estimated to have cost savings ranging from about 440 to about 3000 crores each crore in indian denomination is equals to about 10 million uh, indian rupees so you can add a zero to if you want to convert this into millions similarly <clears throat> it has been used as i mentioned for decisions around standard treatment guidelines so when you talk about uh, certain anti cancer drugs which have uh, which have lim which have some limited health benefit but come at a high cost Uh, but then still they remain cost effective but they need to be considered to for in terms of how long do you prescribe them and this was one of the very contentious drug anti cancer drug that is used in case of breast cancer and the key question was how long do you give it for how many cycles do you give it and again this decision was informed by hta evidence which again has significant implications in terms of cost savings and finally this is the third example that i just wanted to show which comes from again from the context of uh, oncology treatment specifically from radiation oncology for given for breast cancer again the question was should the radiation therapy be given to all types of women with breast cancer or should there be certain ca clinical characteristics based on which you could have different uh, guidelines of whether or not you give and then more importantly how long do you give radiation therapy uh, what are the number of cycles again this evidence was strongly informed Uh, and and here there was very significant heterogeneity in terms of how clinicians were actually delivering care and again coming back to the context you know in a multi payer system like that that we operate in india originally it is very hard to even control the clinician behavior based on any kind of a guidance that you may come up with but creation of single payer systems gives that opportunity to the payer to even uh, make the guidelines adherent for the clinicians because then you can create the it systems that enable the use of uh, healthcare services in a particular manner so that's again one very important aspect the final part that i'll touch upon is <coughs> the the hta during and after covid i think there are clear challenges that came during the covid the first was the extent of speed that the hta researchers were expected to operate in and that meant that there had to be a trade off between the time that you spend on an hta research and the quality of evidence that you uh, ultimately come up with the, the other fact was that given that there are significant uh, externalities of uh, of of covid and significant externalities of healthcare uh, Ill, negative consequences which meant that mere payer perspective perhaps was a limited uh, limited perspective to choose in order to make these uh, do these st assessments and as a result you needed to consider costing from a much more societal view point and you also that meant that you had to have take care of those negative externalities so i'll run through a couple of ex more slides this is just to show that there were certain areas where hta did significantly influence the decisions around covid there were three main areas where we used hta evidence for covid one was around vaccination second around diagnostics and third around therapeutics but the point that i wanted to highlight is that a lot of these hta assessments during covid were actually much more rapid in nature so while there were hta assessments that were guiding decisions these are all mostly rapid assessments rather than the usual ones that would take 6 to 9 months to complete so finally uh, to conclude we feel that there is a significant effort that needs to go along in order to invest on building these initial information systems guidelines etc for hta processes and institutions are extremely important for translation and we as hta researchers would definitely need to balance the trade offs between cost between quality and the speed and the time that we spend 
if this gap between the researcher and policy makers needs to be met. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Shankar. And uh, I do see some questions coming in, so get those uh, thumbs warmed up, keep them coming. We'll try to answer as many as we can at the end during the Q&A. Uh, Mr. Ying Li Chen, I would like to welcome you up for, for your presentation, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Ying Li Chen from Taiwan. Um, yeah, I haven't been speaking in front of that, these many people for quite a long time. So, yeah, today I will be sharing a, a more specific part of the HTA, the patient involvement of HTA after uh, the COVID-19 in Taiwan. So, uh, first of all, uh, let's take a look at the patient group ecologies in Taiwan. And you can see from the uh, figure on the left, we have a Taiwan Aliens of Patient Organization, which uh, a lot of um, big and small patient groups, uh, they form this uh, aliens. And um, so uh, this is also the main contact uh, CDHTA contact with because um, they kind of uh, represent most of the patients uh, in Taiwan. But um, you can see there are still uh, small dots. Uh, they are not affiliated to TAPO, and that means that we still uh, unable or um, that we still uh, not uh, contact uh, these uh, patient groups because they are not affiliated to TAPO. And um, from the, from the uh, map on the right, you can see that when I type patient groups uh, in the search bar, uh, you can see a lot of points uh, in the northern part of Taiwan where Taipei is. So a lot of patient groups are located in Taipei, but there are still other patient groups located in the middle or southern part of Taiwan. And when before the, the pandemic, uh, we are having the difficulty contact them because of the distance and transportation issues. So that's the uh, patient group ecologies. And then uh, let's go to the decision-making process of new drug listing in Taiwan. Uh, some of you might have seen this, this picture in the morning already, but um, uh, in this, in this uh, session, I would like to share with you that um, when we finish our uh, HTA report, uh, we go to the expert meeting. And in the, in the expert meeting discussion period, the NHIA, National Health Insurance Administration, they will also list all the new drugs in process on this patient opinion collection website. So any individual or patient groups, um, they are interested in this new drug or they have either opinions or experiences in using this new drug, they can share their thoughts uh, through this website. And then after the primary recommendation was made in the expert meeting, uh, the, the recommendation will send to the PBRS meeting with the patient uh, opinions uh, gathered uh, in the website. So the PBRS stands for the Pharmaceutical Benefit and Reimbursement Scheme Joint Committee. In this meeting, this is where the final recommendation was made. And in the meeting, there are two patient representative in, in attendance, which means uh, two, two patients, uh, two representatives from patient groups will join the meeting and share their thoughts However, um, they don't have the voting rights for the final recommendation. And whenever uh, a new drug uh, goes to the resubmission uh, process, the, there will be patient groups um, outside of the patient representative can be invited to the meeting and share their experience and opinions uh, in the PBR's meeting. So, in this figure, we can see that there are three points where the patient groups or patient individuals can participate in the 
uh, decision making process. The first one is the opinion collection website and the uh, representatives in the meeting and the patient group's presentations. So here in the patient involvement, we can see that I have show you the, the patient involvement in the NHI process. And outside of the, the decision making process, there are still two, uh, two ways uh, patients can uh, express their opinions. So the first is the pre-PBRS meeting by CDHTA, because um, uh, we want to make sure that the representatives and also the patient groups, they understand uh, what's going on and what will be discussed in the PBRS meeting. So we, we will hold this pre-PBRS PBRS meeting to discuss uh, all the items listed uh, in the PBRS meeting agenda and make sure that uh, they understand and they will shape their opinions uh, that will be, sh they'll be expressed in the meeting. And the second, the second point is the events held by the patient groups. Uh, this includes the workshops, conferences, or roundtable meetings uh, held by the patient groups. So sometimes they, they want to grab uh, attentions from, from either government or from the public. So they will hold this kind of events and invite uh, experts and also uh, the uh, members from the National Health Insurance Administration so they can have more discussions in this kind of events that is outside of the uh, decision making process. So um, in, in the pandemic, there are two things happened and, and make the patient involvement changed. The first thing is the social media, because uh, before the pandemic, most of the events were held in person. And for example, um, for those um, patient groups, they are not located in Taipei or uh, they may be uh, small. Uh, they don't have too many, um, too many ways to, to let others know their, their events they now use uh, social media to advocate uh, their, their needs. And through uh, social media, we realize that there are still a lot of patient groups, big and small, out there, and CDHTA haven't reached them before. So through the social media, we reached more patient groups. And when we reach more patient groups, that means we have more sources for patient opinions and experience than than we have before the pandemic. And the second is the virtual events. So through like Zoom or WebEx or all these online uh, events, uh, we get to attend more events. And because sometimes when these kind of workshops or the conference was held outside of Taipei or to distance or there's a conflict of the timings, uh, we, might, we may not be able to attend these kind of events. However, with these online uh, technologies, uh, the, our project, uh, uh, project members, we can attend more events we, and we have more chances to have exchange our opinions and thoughts uh, with the, the patient groups. So, so um, going forward from these changes, we realized that we need uh, CDHTA, uh, our the patient group program members, we realized that we need to promote more about the channels that patient groups can utilize to speak out that specific, specifically include the patient opinion collection websites because in the, during the conversations with these new patient groups, we, we realized that a lot of these patient groups doesn't know that this website exists. So they have, no, they have no places to share their opinions directly to the decision making process. So this is the first point. And then um, we should keep contact more patient groups to gather opinions and experiences from the precise target groups. Cause um, for example, um, the, the experience in using drugs or drug access is different in the cities and 
in the suburb suburban areas. So if we want to make sure that all opinions are uh, in included and we, should, we need to uh, contact with more patient groups. And the third is that we need to communicate with the patient groups to make sure they can efficiently participate in the HTA process. Cause, and in this point, uh, I have uh, discussed a little bit in the morning that we realized that a lot of patient representatives, they may not be able to fully understand the items and the talking points uh, in the PBRS meeting. So in these PB, the pre-PBRS meeting, uh, we need to uh, communicate or conversation, uh, do more conversation with the patient groups so that uh, they can form their opinions and, and uh, share, share the, their opinions to the PBRS committee members. And then that leads to the last, the last point, which is um, in the future, we want to let the right people sp speak at the right time to, uh, on the right topic. So the patients, uh, the, the patients are heard, so, and the decision making will be more inclusive in the future. And thank you. I would like to uh, thanks for the patient group team of CDHTA and also the support from our government and also most importantly to the HTA Shaolin and HITAB for me to share up my experience here uh, in Thailand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ying Li, for, that, for sharing this, this new area of HTA. We look forward to exploring more during the, the Q&A session. Next up is Dr. Mi Yong. Uh, after you. Uh, yeah, good to see you all. Uh, my name is Mi Young Che from South Korea. Uh, I'm working at NECA, and uh, it's um, I will introduce our. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will introduce the, yeah for uh, under, your understanding. Um, yeah, I I guess you will you're familiar with the Korean dramas and uh, some idols like BTS and Blackpink. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> uh, we uh, have um, 51 million people and uh, we spend GDP about 8.8% uh, 8 .8%. Uh, We have national health insurance system and one single payer uh, national health insurance service and it's based on people's service. So we are expanding our DRG system for uh, control our volume. Uh, about NECA, yeah, uh, shortly I will introduce. Yeah, we uh, established uh, 2008. Uh, we recently we moved to the nice building in the picture. Yeah. Uh, NECA is the uh, abbreviation for National Evidence-Based Healthcare Collaborating Agency. Uh, NECA's law uh, in the HTA life cycle from the birth to the end, the NECA uh, doing uh, horizon scanning to the new health technology assessment and uh, HT uh, reassessment. I summar summarized our law into the fourth. Uh, in accordance to the law, uh, the new health technology assessment is mandatory for the coverage, uh, for the safety and effectiveness to the public health. And the second is, um, yeah, it, is it was launched from 2017, uh, health technology reassessment. Yeah, from, uh, yeah, from the 2020, during the pandemic, uh, every year uh, we uh, uh, we produce the HDR report, uh, 50 yeah, topics every year, actually. Yeah. And the third is clinical practice guideline. Actually, it was the fundamental uh, role 
of NECA, the collaborating with the medical society, uh, is accelerated during the pandemic for the COVID-19 living guideline. Uh, the last is the uh, the patient. Yeah, we established uh, for uh, investigator initiated clinical research supported by the government. Yeah, uh, effect of the COVID-19 and uh, HTA challenges. Yeah, the first is the um, interest increase in innovative technology and telehealth. Uh, NECA established the Innovative HDA Committee. Uh, so there is the, some um, uh, policymakers, uh, representative medical societies, uh, and some high technologies. And um, so it is still the pilot status, and, but the regulation revised 2019. So over 30 high -test technology reviewed. And uh, yeah, from this year, yeah, we integrate the review process with the Korean FTA agency. And the interest in the telehealth is uh, dramatically changed. Uh, actually, before the COVID-19, uh, usually the uh, general uh, practitioners, yeah, primary clinicians, very um, uh, resistant about the telehealth. The concern of the competition with the um, big hospitals and the price reimbursement pro problem, but the after COVID-19, uh, there was some uh, periodically allowed to the COVID-19 patients and some very old ages have chronic diseases, uh, so experience the. Uh, periodical allowance, they, uh, there was started to effort to communication, yeah, bringing into the system. Yeah, so it is uh, it's a, um, positive. Yeah, so this year we had four forums for telehealth medicine implementation. So NECA and the Society for Big Data Implementation, yes, we are from the May of this year, uh, the fourth, yeah, to make some uh, strategy for um, the possibility and the practical implementation. And some, yeah, we invited academic leaders and the medical society uh, clinicians and legislation stakeholders and policy makers. So um, it is still um, preliminary stage, but uh, we think it is very positive um, for uh, the clinicians, especially the community of GP of Korea. They started to discuss about this problem. And the, the guideline and HDA linkage. Yeah, this is a picture from um, a Lancet uh, this year, uh, the new ne ecosystem. For, uh, has this making. So clinical practice guideline in HTA shares very similar process uh, about the uh, evidence synthesis and the implementation supporting. So uh, our activities from the establishment, we uh, provided handbooks or manuals for guideline developers and uh, co-development and consulting with the medical society. And it is strength that coverage issue, like telemedicine, and complex can be solved by cooperation with medication, uh, medical society, and can expect the reallocation medical re uh, resources by voluntary efforts of clinicians. Yeah, this is the Korean uh, COVID-19 living guideline activities. Yes, so actually the NECA HTA does not in include the medication um, economic evaluation, but in the guideline, it was possible to review with the medical uh, society. And yeah, this is a uh, diagram of the multidisciplinary um, guideline team. Yeah, there was another issue was the rapid evidence providing issue. So um, 
we had a uh, short research about our uh, 7780 TA reports, and it was related to the uh, systematic review uh, and study selection period and data extraction and synthesis uh, related to the um, uh, our burden that works and the time. So, um, yeah, it, we reviewed five year five programs, semi-automations, and we now use confidence use for rapid evidence uh, synthesis, so living evidence review and rapid response uh, during the COVID-19. And it was possible, so um, rapid response to the uh, government and the medical society. And the last year, the, like the Taiwan, uh, we started to public uh, participants from 2018. And uh, the lay person, about 100, yeah, they participate the new has technology and HDR and guideline process. So topic suggestion, priority select, uh, decision and implementation, and the NECA supporters, volunteers are also involved in the, our process. And they active, actively they, um, uh, disseminate our uh, activity during the uh, yeah, social media and the yeah, Twitters or other things. Yeah, in summary, yeah, uh, every HTA process has been strengthened yeah, for transparent decision making. And during the COVID-19, we realized that uh, effective way for HTA was needed and the internal and external movement toward to the enhance the impact of policy making. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Yeah. All right, last but not least, Dr. Tessa. And when you're finished, please take your seat at the panelist uh, row here. Thanks. Okay. Um, I had black hair then. Now I have white hair. So uh, I am Tessa. And that was Tessa pre-COVID. <laughs> OK, so uh, I'm very honored to be here to speak before you. And I'm actually very happy to be here, back in Asia. OK, so let me start with the topic, which is uh, the global perspective on the role of HTA in informing research priorities in the post-COVID-19 era. I've taken liberties with my interpretation of this topic, so I hope you will give me that liberty. So first of all, what is the post-COVID-19 era? Um, it is characterized, and we're still in this era, by macroeconomic and fiscal fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has been exacerbated by the inflationary consequences of the war in Ukraine. There is a slowdown in macroeconomic growth, widening inequalities, increased poverty, and a constrained fiscal space, resulting in a lower potential for social expenditures by the government, including on health. This is such a big crisis for us. But as I have learned from our Thai colleagues, crisis equals opportunity. They did it with the Asian fiscal crisis, uh, that was when they launched their UHC, and they are now very successful. So let us take heart in this experience, and let us see what we can learn about HDA improvements in the post-COVID era. So, the first is decisions during COVID-19 
were characterized by the following elements. One was it was a very complex situation. You could not do your projections, extrapolations, because we didn't know. There was such non-linearity evident in what was happening in terms of the pandemic, okay? There was so much uncertainty. Nobody knew about the agent at the start. Nobody knew about the efficacy of the drugs. Nobody knew about the efficacy of any vaccines, any of the diagnostic tests, the accuracy, et cetera. So there was so much uncertainty. And these uh, products were being churned out very quickly and being put out um, under emergency uh, use approval. The urgency, as I have said, has been there because there was such a large impact on both health and the economy. Decisions needed to be done very fast. And we didn't know where this impact was occurring. We just knew it was uneven. There were, more, there were some populations which were suffering more and some populations which were relatively spared. And finally, we know that there are multiple layers of decision making, particularly because at certain points in time, the pandemic was actually localized in some of the countries. And there was need for um, a really coordinated approach at the, co at the national or federal level and at the local level. So, where do you see all of these very problematic things really meeting together and producing a decision-making situation where HDA is supposed to provide, uh, uh, to inform this decision? So, how did HDA cope? Before you can answer the question of how did HDA cope, the question was, how was HDA before COVID-19? So I just want to give you a little background. We ran a global HDA survey in 2020, 2021. So they were referring to the situation maybe pre-COVID or a little into COVID. There were a total of 127 responses from the member states. So the first thing you need to look at is before you can respond, you want to know what is the status of HDA in that country if they will be able to respond. Of these 127 responses, 100, there are 194 member states in WHO. So 127 responses, of which 102 said they had an HDA mechanism which allowed for systematic decision making. Now this we accept at face value, but you must understand that before you can actually respond rapidly, you need to be able to respond in a systematic way in ordinary situation. So we were not in such a good situation um, even before COVID. And in particular, there is one mechanism which is rapid HDA. And we did ask this question, how many of you are authorized to do rapid HDA? And about 50 of them said, yes, we can do rapid HDA and 30 actually said no, they did not have this mechanism for rapid HDA. So that's an important thing um, to, to have an authorization to do rapid HDA, particularly if you have guidances saying this is how you should do your HDA because rapid HDA has a few um, ways of, of which are not standardized in that sense. Okay, so also, if you have rapid HDA, the two main problems, aside from the uncertainty of the data that you face are one, transparency, and number two, legitimacy of the process. So even before, uh, this is about the standard HDA, you can already see in terms of legitimacy that there was very limited involvement in these countries in terms of HDA appraisal, or actually in all the steps of HDA, 
by the consumer groups, patient groups, and actually the other disciplines like social scientists and economists um, who are really needed during COVID-19. And I just want to point out that um, the Taiwan uh, presentation actually said this, that actually there is an opportunity to actually increase legitimacy uh, by participation of these direct stakeholders through the use of, uh, through virtual participation. So perhaps that is the one of the things that we can carry forward. In terms of transparency, we didn't also do very well. Less than 50% were actually documenting what they were doing um, in terms of standard HDA. So we are really putting ourselves at risk when we do rapid HDA and we do not do very good documentation and uh, facilitate transparency. So rapid HDA um, is really more about improving legitimacy, improving transparency. The other challenge, aside from the process, was really we had a flood of products that we needed to evaluate. And uh, they were developed in record time, record relative to before. And I'm telling you now, the challenge will be even greater. If ever we will have another pandemic or even epidemic, the goal really now is to have a 100-day development period for new products. That is an actual enunciated global goal. So this means we will have many products coming into uh, the production line very, very quickly, and therefore we need to adapt our processes. The rapid HDA was really developed primarily for drugs and vaccines. There is a question about traditional medicine and how you know many of us, particularly in Asia, because of lack of access to anything, started looking back at traditional medicine. So the question is, how do you do rapid HDA for traditional medicine? And then you also have the lack of data, not just with uncertainty on efficacy and safety, and I give the prime example of ivermectin. And the approach has been, let us do real world evidence, let us establish where we can patient registries, and then we iterate the rapid HDA as new evidence comes in from the other countries. So, this is something similar to living guidelines. We will have living HDA. And finally, it is to be admitted there is very limited role of cost effectiveness analysis or price considerations because this was something like the rule of rescue. It was a supplier's market. You would buy it if it was available at whatever price. Okay, so we had limited role here for CEA and price considerations. And um, so rapid HDA primarily for drugs and vaccines, maybe not for traditional medicine, much less so for diagnostic tests, much less so for health system interventions. All of this came into the fore during COVID-19, telemedicine, oxygen plants, pulse oximeters, manufacturing plants for masks, etc logistics and supply systems, stockpiles, electronic medical records and their portability, and now looking into the future preparedness inputs. This all have, if you decide to invest in them, all have opportunity cost and theoretically should be subjected to the same HDA methodology. But our methods are not very well established for these types of interventions. And finally, we have another set of interventions, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the most prominent of which were mobility restrictions. And here, we really needed new data. We needed data on mobility. We needed data on risk perceptions, because that is what influenced the action of the public. And it is not one point in time, 
data collection. Mobility patterns, risk perceptions changed along the course of the pandemic. You needed to collect the data so that you could model this more accurately. So um, finally, there were new outcomes. Well, not new, a new focus on outcomes. One was on equity, distributional consequences. So for example, vaccines, one of the main questions was, should we start giving our limited supply of vaccines for a booster dose, or should we complete the second dose first? Those were questions of equity. The main thing also was the macroeconomic impact. We in this room are not very used to uh, measuring macroeconomic impact. This is the impact on the GDP. But it is very important, any particularly the lockdown interventions had a great uh, impact on the macroeconomy. And then there were subnational considerations, need for subnational data and modeling, and the impact into the future. What was the long-term impact, medium to long-term impact of a decrease in coverage of essential health services, for example, delays in cancer treatment, cancer surgery? What is the impact of uh, closure of education on human capital and uh, ability to interpret, uh, to convert this into health outcomes? So we have very little experience with actually doing this real time. So just continuing the, uh, the metaphor of the COVID-19 pandemic, how do we talk about preparedness in HDA for the next pandemic when and if it occurs? One is institutionalized HDA. What do I mean by this? Not the usual inputs, how many people, budgets, etc. Here we're specifically talking because of the problems of communication and infodemic, one is really establishing a close relationship with the policymakers, really close relationship. And the second one is establishing trust and confidence in HDA from the general public. And then the second one is to improve rapid HDA dealing with uh, uncertainty, maybe more uncertainty analysis, threshold analysis. We can go into a little bit more on this. More transparency in making trade-offs, more inclusiveness for legitimacy, and finally, protection against liability. And I want to give you something. This is news. Uh, let me, uh, please allow me to read this. In one country, it is a complicated truth that every decision of the Ministry of Health must go through the health technology mechanism, which at times is appropriate. But there are some situations when the recommendation takes too long and effectivity is lost, like what happened with the COVID vaccines. The lawmaker said she is open to filing a measure that would amend certain provisions in the UHC law that gives too much power to the health technology assessment mechanism. This is a actual newspaper article. So we need to guard against this protection against liability in this particular sense for the health technology assessment agency. So, and then we develop new methods, competencies and tools. We need to do, we need more competency in dynamic modeling. We need more competency in integrated epidemiologic and macroeconomic modeling. We need to standardize and develop HDA methods for traditional medicine, diagnostic tests, medical devices, health system interventions, non-pharmacologic interventions. And these are both the standard and the rapid HDA. We need to be better able to capture outcomes on equity, poverty impact, and impact into the future. We should collect more data on mobility, on risk preferences, and finally, we should actually try to explore regional initiatives and collaboration 
in response to all of these needs for information to inform the decisions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tessip. And other speakers, welcome you to the platform here for our Q&A session. We have a lot of questions, so thank you for your active participation. We will uh, start with some of the more popular ones um, as our speakers get settled in. And feel free to add more. If we have time, we'll try to reach them. Okay, everyone's settled and has your mics. Are you ready to rumble? Yeah? Okay, let's do it. So we're going to go by uh, popularity of votes here in the beginning. So the first question to Professor Shankar. We would like to hear more about the data generation process to support the creation and development of the national case reference on health economics. Thanks. Okay. I think uh, we did have a, a small discussion on that in the morning as well. I, uh, we... Uh, in terms of, in the process of development of this reference case, we uh, first tried doing a review of the existing guidelines. Then the next step was we tried looking at what factors influenced the adherence to those uh, specific parameters of the guidelines in other contexts uh, where the, these guidelines are prevalent. And then based on that, we also looked at what are the, what are the nuances of the financing system and the payment systems within our own country which meant that there had to be certain uh, adaptation of those uh, reference case guidelines. And based on that, a, a draft guideline was created and which was discussed very uh, in, in, our, in our technical appraisal groups. And finally, based on that, the guideline was finally drafted. So that was the overall process of development. Okay, thank you. Moving on to our next question, which is now Topping the list at five votes here to Professor Ingley. Tommy, how does patient involvement influence the decision? Is there a criteria for involving specific patients, such as do they need to understand the concept of HTA, or does it act like a more like a blinded study? Um, okay, so um, like uh, in my presentations, there are three parts where the patient groups can participate in the uh, decision making process, and for the first. The first thing in the, the opinion collection website, um, there's no any there's no certain criteria for for to to submit your opinion. So as long as you are registered to that website, and um, you are you are free to share any opinions, and um, it is a form based. Uh, there are certain questions you can answer. So so the first thing is that no, but uh, in the in the PBRS meeting, the representatives uh, uh, recommended by the patient groups, uh, we mostly uh, um, accept the recommendations by the TAPO organization. So um, we have been cooperating with each other for quite some years. And in that case, uh, they are quite familiar with the HTA process. So I hope that answers the question. I hope so. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question on that maybe we can come back to that later. Um, moving on, and it's nice how the, the votes are, are proving to be e egalitarian in their allocation. So moving on, a uh, question for, uh, for Dr. Myung. Uh, as noted in the presentation of the NEC, uh, regarding the NECA, COVID has showed us there's a, a lot of duplication uh, happening across HT agencies. Any thoughts on how we can reduce these uh, post-COVID? Yeah. Yeah, it's very uh, great question. Uh, actually, we support what uh, with the duplicate the evidence uh, table uh, producing. So uh, from the start, we um, collaborate with the Australian National Living Guideline Team, and they uh, sent us many information about uh, their systematic review results and the. Uh, they suggested the Revlon file <laughs> for their um, material analysis. Uh, and they, uh, there is a um, website of the recommendation sharing 
of every, uh, every national or uh, institutional guideline for COVID-19. Uh, it was established, so uh, yeah, we possibly used to the the other countries and the other recommendations or at least existing systematic review for the research using. Thank you. And you mentioned you were working with the Australian government. Uh, were there other national or, or, or other partners you were, would bring into that collaboration? Uh, yeah. Uh, NECA is in this, uh, had a great center from 2021. So the great group uh, is a methodology group and they working with the WHO guideline. And so we also contacted the great group and the sharing the information. Also. Thank you. Uh, Tessa, please. Yeah, I, I want to jump into this conversation because uh, one of the problems is when do you start releasing results, particularly for WHO? And mm -hmm. I remember one of the specific questions was, why is WHO still insisting on two weeks of, um, of isolation? after diagnosis versus other countries who are now moving down to five days. And it is, it's not just a question of policy, it is a question in modeling. It is really because that is the period of infectiousness. And the answer was something like, well, there is the science and there is the policy. And some countries have uh, other considerations why they might take a different perspective on this. But I think uh, if you follow, for example, the US CDC, that one of their major impetus for actually uh, 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 reorganizing or changing US CDC is really to be more responsive in terms of releasing the data and not to be behind. I think WHO might need to learn. I have been party to, to all of the COVID-19 conferences. We actually have more data before we publicly release it. And the question really is, at which point do you release the data so that HTA agencies, modelers can start to use it? I think that's still a question uh, to be answered. Okay, thank you. Any further thoughts from the, from the panel on that question? Okay, if not, we can move along. Um, the next question is um, about adaptive HTA. Um, a straightforward one. How do we perform adaptive HTA as part of rapid HTA? I guess that's a question for Dr. Tessa based on your presentation. Um, I'm not so sure how you would differentiate between that. I focus more on rapid HTA and really, um, that means, I think to a large extent, rapid HDA would really be improved by the sharing of, for example, efficacy data. All of that data is being released on time. Everybody is, is really looking at it. So whether you adapt that or you, you get that into your rapid HDA as is, I think that's pretty much what all countries would be doing. Is, is one of which really shortens the period of time. So I think here, this is where you establish partnerships or you have a central science agency who would come out with that. But I think it is really more about rapid HTA and adapting it is, uh, I think it's more the rapid which is, which is better and you adapt it as part of rapid. Okay, thank you. And yes, I have a follow up, but after you, Professor. Okay. Just to add to, I think, what uh, has been mentioned, uh, the adaptive HTA methods use a variety of different uh, techniques, ranging from doing a simple evidence, quick adapt, uh, evidence synthesis, to a price benchmarking, to even making use of existing models and trying to uh, populate these models with your local data in order to generate uh, more lo locally, contextually relevant evidence. What we uh, realized in a, in, a, in, a, in a short appraisal process was that uh, while these adaptive technologies might be very good, and one of the applications that we found was relevant, is that these adaptive HTA technologies, methodologies may be very relevant for your topic prioritization process. 
So in order to eliminate the technologies that are clearly not cost effective based on these adaptive uh, methodologies, there's a very strong merit in using these. Uh, to make use of these adaptive methodologies for replacing the uh, full HTAs would still, uh, I think, will have will will take more time to refine our tech methodologies in order to make use of them. Okay, thank you. And I had a follow-up question. It disappeared into the uh, into this pool of questions. Um, there was a question uh, related to this: Is will the uh, will the WHO be coming out with? Oh, where was the question? Bear with me for a moment. You know, will the WHO be, st be starting to develop a new HTA methods, especially for non-pharmaceutical intervention? Um, for Dr. Tessa. So, for non-pharmaceutical interventions, we we actually have started work on that, particularly on mobility restrictions. Uh, and this is being done with OECD and the World Bank. And the primary, our primary recommendation is integrated epidemiologic and macroeconomic modeling. And we've started a few, a work with a few countries, South Africa, I think the Philippines here in Asia. It's also done in Sri Lanka, uh, Argentina, those four countries, a little in Mexico. Uh, really to show this proof of concept. And, and let me tell you, because it is very important, because frequently what happens is the trade-off between health and uh, impact on GDP. In one particular country, they meet at the table, this, um, this uh, emergency coordination committee, the one who makes the decision, and the, and the uh, Minister of Health says, well, if we uh, do the lockdown now in, for this particular part and for this how long, uh, we will save X number of lives. And then the economics or planning agency comes in and also say, for every death you avert, I lose X number of jobs. And they get together in the same table, but you don't know whether they use the same assumptions in terms of the progress of the epidemic. And so what we're saying is you need to do integrated epidemiologic and macroeconomic modeling. So we will, we've will we come out with one report on this, very general. This second report will be more specific. We hope to come out with it, it's supposed to be end of this year, but I think we will be doing it uh, first part of the uh, quarter one. But that will be a report from the World Bank OECD and WHO. Wonderful, thank you for that. We're, we're looking forward to that report. Uh, shifting gears a bit back to uh, more patient-centered uh, questions. Um, let's see, where did it go? Sorry, I was looking at uh, 2CDE Taiwan. How are the patient uh, Oh, where did it, how are the patient opinions gathered on the website? Is it based on a survey? If so, how is the survey structured? Um, yeah, okay, so to this question, thank you. And um, so it is a form-based uh, uh, response. So uh, when, when the patient groups or individuals log into the website, um, uh, a form with a short answer questions will be provided and uh, these questions, including like, uh, ha have you using this drug before, and what was the experience, or uh, for this uh, indication, uh, what's the unmet need to you, or how this disease uh, has affected your daily life. So these sort of the questions for the for the individual or the patient group to answer, and so with these questions. Uh, there is a certain logic flow for them to go through and come back with their their opinions. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, a more general question. Um, where, here we are at the top. Uh, I want to hear how HDA can help contribute in responses to fake news or false information circulated during COVID. What are effective and ineffective? Um, it's a big question, not targeted to any specific uh, speaker, but uh, does anyone want to take a crack at this? I'll start. Thanks, I, I think I started with that when I said institutionalize your HTA, and by that I mean 
you have your different audiences. So for your policymakers and stakeholders, make sure at, as early as possible to really develop a close relationship, hopefully a legally mandated relationship with your policymakers. That would be the first one. But the more important one is actually what uh, one of the, uh, when I was talking to a, to an HDA mechanism, the chair who was newly inaugurated, what I told her was, you know your first job, it is to establish the credibility of this HDA uh, mechanism. You need to develop the trust of the public before any of this happens. That would be what we call preparedness for HDA. It is really not just talking about um, uh, having, having the resources, having a budget line, having human resources, uh, not just having quality assured uh, reports, but really having the mechanisms to communicate and establish trust with your stakeholders. That would be, I think that's a general lesson for the, not just for HDA, but for the entire government. Indeed, wonderful, thank you. And I, I welcome other panelists to respond to that based on your experience. I think the point that uh, Tessa has made adequately summarizes the whole thing. And the whole point also comes, comes back to the deliberative processes that we need to establish for a much more participatory mm -hmm. approach uh, among the stakeholders, which, brings, which builds the overall legitimacy of the entire evidence that is created. And people then start to look, both, not just the policymakers, but also the general stakeholders, they start to look at the evidence that is coming out from the HD as something that is much more valid and true. Mm -hmm. I think that it's that, that sorts out a lot of problems, actually. Okay, wonderful. And that, I think that, that ties into one of the other questions in, in the flurry here uh, for you, Professor Shankar, regarding is there a, 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 a legally mandated relationship uh, between the HTA work you're doing and the decisions of the, of the Indian government? So, so far, there is, it's not uh, backed up with a legal mandate. And that's what we are trying to work on by, by having this uh, draft bill, which potentially if tabled in the Indian parliament can lead to much more of a statutory role that HTA can play. But I do see that for some time to come, it will be much more of a functional recommendatory relationship that will continue to exist. But as long as this relationship tends to prove value to the payers and to the other stakeholders, I think it, it tends to get the buy-in and, and the utilization improves. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, I, something more uh, future-facing here. How, can, how HTA can anticipate the development of precision medicine in the near future? It's a new field for me. I welcome the panelists to have, if you have any thoughts on this question. That's a stumper. Congratulations on whoever asked that one. Well done. <laughs> you beat the pros. I think the precision medicine question is the same as for any other any okay. other topic as well, so I wouldn't have anything okay. specific. So you don't see a distinction between the current methods, rapid assessments, and what might be coming in the precision medicine space? Okay. All right. Well, we have just a minute left, so I'll, I'll leave it for any closing remarks from the panelists uh, before we move on to the networking. If none, I think we can we can wrap it up here. Thank you very much for your presentations and participation. Thank you. All right, everyone. See you at the networking event. Say again. <laughs> I tried. It's actually a bit, uh, it gets a bit challenging. When you put it in but thank you for presenting and for your patience with the process. Yeah, okay. Thank you. All right. No, no, <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. Can I get your attention briefly? Okay, so before we leave this room, let me quickly share you the information about the direction to the networking event that will be at the Sunset Terrace Bar for at 5 p.m. today. So we prepared a video for you, and it will be playing on the screen right now. <laughs>